Hi, Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We have two terrific poets with us today, Clyde Matson and Jamie O'Halloran. Clyde will read first and then Jamie. Clyde Matson hung with Beats in New York City in the 1960s and reconnected when he performed Hello Paradise, Paradise Goodbye at the European Beat Studies Studies Network in 2017 in Paris. The passionate intensity that runs through us all emerged while backpacking in the Sierra when he witnessed diseased trees and lakes in decay and shrouded in smoke from a wildfire. And he began that poem. He won the 2003 Penn Oakland Josephine Miles National Literary Award, City of Berkeley, Lifetime Achievement for Poetry in 2012, and was made Lifetime Beat Poet Laureate by National Beat Poetry Foundation. Here's a wonderful poet, Clive Matson. Thank you, Harry. It's lovely to be here. And this is Poetry Hour, but I hear you also call it Creative Chaos. Well, that's the whole thing. Creative Chaos started in March 2020. Actually, it was called, I think it was called Unorganized um, <laughs> Unorganized chaos, Creative Chaos at the time, but it, it was originally <laughs> four shows. Well, here's the woman who, who began it right here. Um, um, it was originally called Organized Chaos. Okay. Organized Chaos. <laughs> and it was, in my memory, it was four days a week uh, live shows and then three days, but it was, uh, this is part of it. This is just part of it. Uh -huh. Well, that's a very attractive name. In fact, all the variations are very attractive. <laughs> Organized chaos. Get our minds around that, huh? Someone was complaining about James Joyce and how it was just too confusing, but we know from the bi biographies that Finnegan's Wake was composed very carefully, page by page. He spent hours on every page. So if it looks like chaos, that's conscious chaos? I don't know. Creative chaos. <laughs> Creative chaos, yeah. Yeah. So the big event for me as a poet was as a 17-year-old, I was a a um, scholarship student at University of Chicago. And it just happened that in 1959, my freshman year, that the um, editor of Chicago Review, which is a very prestigious academic magazine, had fallen in love with Beach Generation writers. And what Allen Ginsberg did in those years Whenever, whenever anyone showed an interest in him, he would say, yes, you may publish some of my poems, as long as you also include Philip Whalen, Gregory Corso, William Burroughs, Jack Kerouac, and suddenly there was a long list. And Irving Rosenthal, the editor, went for the whole list and composed an hmm. issue of the Chicago Review that was all Beat Generation poets. And somehow... I have no idea how. I, I'd love to know. The because um, Irving Rosenthal was very clever, and he knew how to look like he was one of the academics while he was pursuing his own own aesthetic. Somehow, the uh, administration found out what he was doing, and they said, "You can't do that." And he said back, "Oh yes, I can." And he took all the material off campus, organized a reading at the. Um, Oh, what was it? It was a music hall in downtown, downtown Chicago. It wasn't called Creative Chaos. <laughs> it's just gone where Creative Chaos was. Uh, but it was the, it, 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 the, that issue of the Chicago Review became, uh, let's see, became Big Table, became the first issue of Big Table, and they had a big reading at the music hall in downtown uh, Chicago. And, you know, I'm a kid. I didn't know what was going on. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was relating to some of the classes I was taking very much. But I also knew it was very much 
cer- very cerebral, very much in my head. And my friend uh, Elliot took me to the Gate of Horn. That was the music hall in Chicago, the Gate of Horn reading. There were maybe 300 people there. And the energy was marvelous. They were reading with full engagement. I couldn't have told you at the time. It's looking back that I can see it. That the beats read with full engagement of body, heart, and mind. Mm-hmm. And it was the energy was just fabulous. They knew they were onto something. And somewhere along the line, there was a question, question and answer session, and Gregory Corso was asked who his influences were. And here I am standing at the back back of the room with a few rebels who were saying, well, these guys are all communists. And they found they couldn't, they could, I know now it's hilarious. It's just comic, but I'm, my eyes are wide open. I'm listening to this. <laughs> They're all communists and they found they couldn't influence the political process. So they turned to poetry. Hmm. Like poetry was more, more accepting and more um, understanding of politics than the political parties. Uh, Anyway, Gregory Corso was asked, what are your influences? And Gregory started listing the canon. Well, Mm. how many times have I said this? I was 17 and my eyes are wide open, but I had an idea even at 17 what the canon was. And I listened to him and said, okay, so he's listing Homer, he's listing Sappho, he's listing Simonides, he's listing... Emily Dickinson, he's listing Walt Whitman. He's lying. He's not telling what his personal influences are, and I just kind of dismissed it. But a few years later, I realized that was a very good answer. The academics, the people the University of Chicago was trying to teach me, weren't weren't listening to the canon. They were just indulging in their prejudices. But the beats had already studied the canon. They loved poetry. They knew what made poetry positive. They knew what we were listening to in poetry. And they were expressing it in a modern way as best they could. So it was a wonderful answer. And that stayed with me all these years. We started, my students started a um, journal called Wordswell. Their logo is behind me, you can see it. Wordswell Journal, and uh, they put in as their aesthetic full engagement of body, heart, and mind. And that's, they resonate with that because there's so little out there that's doing that. Oh, we have a plethora of poetry. Oh, yes, I'm not saying we don't have a plethora of poetry. We do, but we have very little that's fully engaged and fully committed to communicating to people. So it's it's really fun to see them pick up that feeling. This, how many years from 1959 is it? It must be uh, 50, 60, 64 years, isn't it? Yeah, it's 64 years later that what the beats showed is now something that we need. And the young people who are alert to what's going on recognize that we need it and recognize in all the submissions that come their way when there is some of that commitment and some of that full engagement. Of course, they also come into my classes with a, a uh, an apparatus already in their minds on how to read poetry, and we sometimes call it puzzle tree, to figure out what in the world the poet is trying to communicate to us. But there was no doubt in the beats what they were trying to communicate at any point. And I think that's how what poetry is supposed to do is supposed to tell our personal truth and to communicate it, not to make a puzzle of it. Allen Ginsberg had a saying later in life, he said that what the poet does is make the private world public. And you join that with Carl Rogers saying, what is the most personal is also the most universal. And suddenly you have the key to the whole, the whole enterprise. 
so that's that's the cornerstone of my life. <laughs> and I am just so amused that I thought so little of it out. It just happened. I went by instinct from place to place. And that the things that attracted me early on as a 17-year-old attract me now as an 82-year-old. Now, Harry, you could look at me the way dad looked at some guys of his generation, say, oh, he's in his second childhood. And he would dismiss them. And I feel like I'm in my second childhood, and it's great. That's where I've always been, really. And I've, I've gone through all my various stages, and one of them was to get attracted to form. And that wasn't uh, anything that beats pride of themselves in, although some of them wrote in forms. But it's part of poetry. The sound is part of poetry. And I, uh, in the 80s, I got into writing sonnets, and I've turned back to them occasionally, not to write them, but just to read them. And I thought I'd start off with a couple of these. The peacock drags its tail behind, and string-like feathers drape the ground until a threat or mating urge alerts the muscles in its spine. Russell, sigh, rows of turquoise eyes arch up and out, their rims green-brown, their cores blue-black. In one long surge, the tail bends straight. Its colors shine. Ninety allies stare from the fan without a blink. What sense can tell if they're for show or if they're live? The peacock struts. See this? See that? An inner mind has touched each cell. And each one blossoms with an eye. I was poet in residence at Wilbur Hot Springs in Northern California when I wrote that poem. And I had plenty of evidence for the poem because Wilbur had three or four peacocks in full, full attire active on the premises. And they had the most heart piercing screams. And the tails would go up, and I would count the eyes in the tails, and they came on average to 90 eyes in the tails. What a miracle, huh? And that poem and the other poems in this book, Hourglass, are about meditation. Let's see if I can get Zoom to see the, see the book. Can you see this? No, it's transparent. <laughs> well, I... I didn't know it was that clear. Now, if I can't get Zoom to see it. <laughs> oh, there it is. It decided. Oh, there it is. There's the book, sort of. So I'll read another one from this book. These are um, they're Italian sonnets, and they have a rhyme scream. A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, F, G. And I made it easier that they're not perfect rhymes. A lot of them are half rhymes or slanted rhymes, as we call them. Here's one when I was feeling sad. In sadness, I walk in sadness through gray scrub. The sky is blue streaked under pinks. I think of all the things I'm not with circling mind, with claimless heart. New grass is green beneath the brush. Each bush is brittle, thorned, and links my loves, my standing, fights I've lost. My head and chest feel stretched apart. I walk through scrub on steep green hills. My legs stride on with little change. Long strings of gems are dew in webs. Deep sadness rises, swells, and spills. How strange this strangeness keeps on strange. 
The sky is blue, laid under reds. This book, uh, published in 80, 87, is that right? 87. They're all, all uh, meditation poems. They're images that came during the meditation, which started out for me as, um, what is it called? A self-hypnosis. That a hypnosis te- taught me how to do this. And although she called it self-hypnosis, and for me it evolved into uh, the Vipassana meditation, which is insight meditation where you do body sweeps and focus your attention where the body asks for attention. And there are um, occasionally these visions would come to me while meditating. And that's, that's what these books are. And I realized that's what these poems are in this book. And I realized that no one who wasn't doing that kind of meditation would quite understand these poems. So I wrote, oh, I'm not going to try to get the book in focus again. So I wrote a travelogue to go with each poem, saying what was going on. Here's one called Ordinary Garden. Doors open and close in peace now. From both sides, translucent screens groove toward the center, meet, and the mind dances through thin layers of dun and burnt rose atoms, then leaps out and blink. The doors open. Air moves or is still. A lizard breathes. Light brown granite crumbles in the sun. The garden of the world is here. The door's motion is silent, smooth, and the mind watches. Music sighs through the body. The 30th year of desert life, a yucca blooms. Yellow bursts open wide in sky. So all emotion are just the thoughts coming into consciousness and then going on, coming into consciousness and going on. You let them drift away. Any meditator is familiar with that process, I would think. I have a younger sister I adore who um, took over being the black sheep of the family after I left, and she became a yoga. And she, she, uh, really understood the poems right off. Well, she gets up at 5.30 in the morning and meditates for an hour. I may, I may do it that much every day, lying on my back in bed, and sometimes I drift off to sleep. And for me, that's just fine, but not for her. She's a yoga. She's got to stay on top of the game. But she has such a sense of humor about it. She would say sometimes she meditates for her hour or hour and a half. And all she does is go over her to-do list. I've always loved that because it takes the mystique out of meditating. But we've been doing this for years, many of us. Like Thich Nhat Hanh's books, like How to Walk. And he teaches you how to walk and be aware of everything that's going on. For uh, many years in my 40s, I I joined a uh, a senior uh, track group. I loved running. And you know, when you run well, it's a meditation. You need to be aware of everything that your body is doing, especially in the sprints. There's no time to take it easy. You have to be efficient. Be aware every moment. There's one in here about that. Let's see if I can find it. Sprinter. 
it's a meditation poem. We're meditating, going around the curve. Do you tilt your body a little more? Let it straighten out a little. Lengthen the stride. Move your, move your, it's just, you have to be supremely conscious every moment. Sprinter. Tick scrabble. Behind, cinder spray as the runner sprints from the line with power that would rupture joints if pushed on through peak stride. But mind drops downward. Lift knees up. Maintain rhythm. Breathe for extra. Legs glide toward corner. Chunk, chunk, chunk. Toes point straight in a line. Body and mind are each other's mirror, and both are changing. Light shimmers. Add length. Bring back arm swing as stride and breath stroke in sync. Air streams by ears. No lungs are deep enough now. Last strength is rallied for the final stretch. Isn't that amazing how our worlds overlap one after the other after the other or over the other and over the other? So while, while meditation was new to me uh, in the 80s, I was very excited to write these poems. The syllables are all counted, all the old old traditional poetry techniques are alive and well in these poems. And I don't think there's a shred of anything beat in them, is there? Not even a shred. Maybe there is, because there is that full engagement. Meditation is all about the relationship between that mind and body. Somebody um, what's his name? I think it's Daniel Garian of Interlit Q. That's an online magazine, a European online magazine, Interlit Q. International Literary Quarterly is what it stands for. Did an interview and we went through my history and how during the 60s, I was in New York with the Beats. So I went from University of Chicago, had a girlfriend, and we went to uh, travel in Europe for a year and came back to New York. And uh, before I had left, I had heard that there was ways to get to Europe by working. You could work on a freighter and get passage, earn your passage to Europe. And uh, so I started hitchhiking toward Montreal from New York. And the guy who picked me up was happened to be Ed Dorn's uh, brother-in-law. Ed Dorn's sister had married Ed Dorn. And Fred Helmers picked me up and said, hey, there's a reading in New York City this weekend. Why don't you put off your trip? Now we'll go and go in here, Ed. And it was at the 12th Street, 12th Street Coffee House in uh, lower Manhattan. And I went and I met all the beats there. Irving Rosenthal was there. Ginsburg was there. James Waring, Bernard Corso, Ed Doran Red. And Diane de Prima was there, and I took down their names and phone numbers. It's as if fate would not let me escape the beats. I went to the Gate of Horn reading and started reading them. And then here I am trying to go to Europe, and I get interrupted. No, you're not going to Europe yet. You're going to go down to Lower East Side and meet the others of the beats. You can't just have that one reading, that one Gate of Horn reading in your past. So when I came back from Europe, my girlfriend came out to the uh, West Coast and I stayed in uh, New York and I started calling the beats and I ended up being mentored by Diane Prima and Irving Rosenthal, really. Much later, 
when some of the, uh, I'll read one of them later, one of the love poems that I later was doing was read by the Allen Ginsberg Project. Did you know that Allen Ginsberg has a project in New York that's going on now? And they read some of my poems and reviewed them, and they said, these are evidence of how far Matson has moved from the beats, because I ran from the sexual predation. I ran from the drugs after imbibing my full quota in a few years. And I, I just stayed away from the party mentality. Uh, but I kept the direct expression of the beats and that full engagement and, and just held it as a precious item, a precious gift in my heart. So the reviewer said, this is evidence of how far Matson has come from the beats and how fundamental they are to his growth. And I thought that was just perfect. Whoever wrote that review, I couldn't find out that it wasn't signed. I said, ex saw exactly what was going on. That interview is in Interlit Q. It's called, what did we call it? We call it Instinct Be My Guide. Because, you know, at 17, I didn't know what was happening. 17, 18, 19, 28, 21, 23, 25, 28, 40. 50, okay, you know, I don't know what's happening. What do the existentialists say? Amor fati. Love your fate. But your fate is unknowable. Or at least that's my, my sense of my own fate. I don't know what it is, but I need to keep keep loving it and keep going where it sends me. And the only guide I had through all of that and continually is instinct. Clive, Clive it's uh, time for us to thank you very much for your erudition and your uh, sagaciousness and your calmness and your meditation. And your, you've really uh, taught me a lot and you've taken me back to the body, mind and heart. And I could listen uh, to you for, for hours. And uh, unfortunately, it's time for us to move on. But I, I just want to thank you for your lovely reading and your, your journey. Because I, I've been on a similar trip uh, that you have. But I'm not going to go into me. But it's just such a, um, a mindfulness that you have. And you, I can see why you're such a wonderful teacher, not only with your poetry, but with the wisdom that you have obtained to pass on to us and to others. So thank you very much. And uh, I'd love to have you come back again another time. Thank so thank you, Clive Matson, for a wonderful reading. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Harry. And you're right. I could just talk for hours. It's lovely being here. <laughs> thank you for having me. <laughs> I could listen to. And so thank you. Jamie O'Halloran is the author of four chapbooks, most recently Corona, Connemara, and Half a Crown. She has published widely in Irish, UK, and US publications, including Southward, Banshee Craning, One Hand Clapping, The Night Heron Barks, and Prairie Schooner. Her poems are included in a dozen anthologies, including Romance Options, Local Wonders, Poems of Our Immediate Surrounds, Mischief, Caprice, and Other Poetic Strategies, and Grand Passion, Poets from Los Angeles and Beyond. She won first place in Southward's 2023 subscriber competition and was first runner up in the 2023 Martin Crawford Award. She lives in Connemara in the west of Ireland, but is reading today from Connecticut. Here's a marvelous poet, Jamie O'Halloran. Thank you so much, Harry. It's really a pleasure to be here. And Clive, oh. R wonderful, wonderful, fascinating hearing you in the poems, the peacock. I, I hope that uh, Hourglass is still available. I'm going to have to to get. I'd love to read all those poems. Um, yeah, I'm I'm really happy to be here, and I'm going to read poems that kind of are all go together. Um, well, mostly. So, um, you know, last year I started writing poems um, in response to the invasion of Ukraine. And so I'm going to read, you know, a bunch of those and they're, I'm reading them in the order in which they were written. 
So most of them go back to, you know, February, March, some a little bit later, but very early after the invasion. And and I'll, well, I don't know if I'll say too much about anything, um, but, uh, you know, okay, so I do live in Ireland. And what, um, one thing that we do in Ireland is we light candles, you know, as a vigil. And, uh, you know, right after the invasion, you know, there was people were saying, you know, show support for the Ukrainians by, you know, turn off all your lights, just having a candle lit. And uh, so I joined with that. And this poem is called Blackout. And there's, well, I'll just, okay, Blackout. Loka samasta suki no bavantu. This evening's lights are out. No candle in the window, just the one I've lit in the shrine of the heart. In the small, sea-dark room where we chant, may all beings be happy and free. After the quarter hour, I flick light on, conscious of my safe state, keeping Kiev in my heart. Eastern Frost The grass was milky this morning, lightly iced. Venus was bright before the sun in a vacant sky. Just below freezing and the morning chorus was hidden, heard, full-throated. The sky was adamant blue, no huff coming from a winter gust. I pruned hydrangeas, potted chives, parsley, tethered a pink rose to a stone wall. The afternoon was bright, dry enough to hang wash on the line. I shredded cabbage for white bean soup, set the table. Who is tending the gardens of Kharkiv? Are birds singing in Kiev? Another coming. Today's Angelus is a thin plonk, like the piano tuner's persistent playing of one black key. Reminder, it is said, this midday chime of the unexpected, where you might be scraping a carrot or reading a book, and some lambent angel materializes right there in front of you with a life-shattering pronouncement like the invasion of a sovereign nation or the shelling of hospitals and sunflowers. Bethlehem is now. Um, this next poem, well, I, um, there's a line in it, and I'm calling this group of poems falling into emptiness. And there's a line in it, it comes from, uh, was said by Alexei Napilnikov, a Ukrainian man, as he was quoted in the New York Times in early March last year, he said, this separation is like falling into emptiness. He was interviewed after he'd gotten his wife and child over the border into Poland. Overhead. We wait for the oncoming, for the convoy east of Kiev to retreat like a turtle's head. I cannot look away from Alexei Nabilnikov who has urged his wife and daughter to flee. This separation is like falling into emptiness. The sky over me this morning was a sort of empty, just magpie's midnight tale, nothing like missiles unleashed over Ukraine. And um, this next poem has the title is a music theory mnemonic for the order of sharps. You know, like every boy does fine. This is fast cars go dangerously around every bend. I heard the woman on the radio, fresh from Ukraine, tell how she left with the city crashing around her. She sounds like this happened decades ago, I say. I heard her say, a helicopter fell in the key of C. And overnight, we spent on the floor. What I heard was not what she said. A helicopter fell in the Kiev Sea. This morning, I listened to wind-scored music, 
for cedar, ash, and beech. I couldn't tell the key. The limbs made a kind of singing and leaves a sort of hymn. Retreat. Wrap me here in night where slender shutters allow only a blink of dawn. Shelter me the way a muscle shell harbors its soft body. Armor me against the seeing time when nothing is the best I can do here where only birds cross the sky and only catkins fall. Leave me in this lack of light where I'll be safe and the duvet's downy layers will spread their own sheen, numbing the irritant day, purling the morning back to dream. You know, with writing, um, you know, thinking about the war, of course, you know, many, many, many miles away, I was looking at images. And there was one I saw in the in the Guardian of a soldier in camouflage. So it was you know, win winter camouflage, autumn camouflage. And uh, it's called Luck of Straw. Here is a soldier, husk garlanded, spot on camo, camo for this season of death. I take him for one of the straw boys, mummers or thieves, hats peaked and down to the chin. They'll crash a wedding to dance with the bride, strawing her with luck, they say. Back to the soldier bound in gold. His song is his flag. Luck is his gun. There was a video that went pretty viral. Maybe everybody here has seen it. It's a woman who... Um, you know, re-entering her house. I'm not sure if it was in Kiev, very likely, and uh, faced with the, the ruin of her home. It's called Etude. A house a woman must leave. But first, she lifts the cover from her pale baby grand, flicks debris off the keys, and runs through some bars of a Schubert impromptu. Then the Chopin, Soundtrack to the room by room shot of the shambles her home is now. As ever, I hear a river in this etude. Its course this day is collapse. So the um, the Dnipro or Dnipro is this major river in Ukraine. It goes down to um, Crimea. And it's, you know, have rivers you know, in, in, in Ireland, our big river, I mean, there is the Shannon, which Shannon was, was a goddess and, you know, the Mississippi. So it's a mythical river in many ways. And there are names for it, Father River, Nero River, River Far Away, Holy River. So this is Dnipro. Uh, and, and when you say Dnipro or Dnipro, depends on whether it's Ukrainian or Russian. And of course, you know, the Russians... You know, especially under the Soviets, when they controlled Ukraine, Russian was the primary language. They suppressed Ukrainian. Dnipro, Dnipr. River, stay your course. Farther river, nearer river. You run through the wild fields, arcing across wheat gold under a brighter blue. You are the artery that brings soul and body to the motherland's heart. River far away. You receive many rivers and ferry them to the sea. Steady, unmuddied passage. Your children branch off and wander like the nomads you once nourished. Holy river, your children will return. When I was first working on these poems, I thought that I, I was first thinking, you know, or was trying to see if they could be worked into being a, a sonnet crown. So originally I was working with that idea and then decided that uh, the form was interfering with what the poems needed to say. But here, this this poem has a bit of it, and it's entitled Echo, and the it begins with uh, the last phrase of the previous poem. Echo. 
Your children will return to make you whole. They'll sow your breadbasket and rebuild homes from rubble. Not all of them left. Some stay in pine, laid head to toe in slim ditches. Others shrouded in bags and set side by side like knives. These trenches are places of rest, not slaughter. Defenders dig to set their shovels down and welcome the displaced home. This poem crest, you know, there are two things, main images. One is there's there's a crest you probably everyone has seen that's an emblem, um, not always on the Ukrainian flag, but um a lot it, it's it it looks like a bird descent and it comes from the Gira Falcon, goes back to when the Vikings were in that part of the world. And it's also it was sparked by the the um the missile strikes at the Kamarkovsk, I believe I might be getting the name wrong, train station early in the war. Crest. See the trident, the gold lines on the field of blue. It is not of the sea, but sky, not a spear, but a bird that arrived with the Vikings, the gear falcon, drawn in thin lines, an abstraction of a bird. Body and wings descending, not rising. Trinity, not trident. Hard lines make a box of the bird, a vessel for breath. Box of wheat fields, box of sky, box of flag waving wheat and sky, boxes of pine when there was breath to bury each spirit for its singular breath. No boxes now, but bags, deflated like the bodies they barely cover. The sunken, denimed legs still as logs. The breath vanished, the boxes emptied. The bird, the bird, the bird. This war had me thinking of um, the invasion of Iraq and images and things that were going through my consciousness back then. Dreamt again. The wind shuffled the roof tiles like a shaky gambler, dealing the aces away. That gust pricked my dream with a random signature. I fell then into a vision from one of the last wars. Clay tiles scudded, nothing like missiles over Baghdad, except in my nightmare where my worries erupted like bolts from an IED. A hawk traces O's of wonder and hurt, the stunning quiet of clattering clouds in the oak-framed eastern sky. And I'm going to read just one more of these. I don't have that many more. I'm working on, still working on the sequence. And uh, I will say that we um, we welcomed a Ukrainian woman and her young child that lived with us for the better part of a year. Uh, they had to leave about a month or two early because we had a, a, a flood in our house. Our pipes burst and it was... Anyway, so we didn't have room for them again because the, the house was falling apart. This is called Refuge. Expect trauma, they tell prospective hosts. How do we translate comfort, safety? Interpret, make yourself at home. Best not say the word, that not of the left behind, the forsaken life. What is the fear of return? What is the cost of staying? And I'm going to change the mood. Next week is a uh, wedding anniversary. And so I thought I would read a couple of poems for my husband, Carl. And this first one was, um, Harry had the, um, that you were publishing uh, times three. Three times three, and then you publish this poem. It's called "Singing the Little Flower." And some of you, you may—I think you knew Peter Schneider, who uh, was a poet and publisher, 
and also a musician, a really gifted songwriter. And so we were working on a song that he had written about uh, Saint-Thérèse of Lisieux, also known as The Little Flower. Singing The Little Flower. By the window, westered with sun and early green, trees not yet budding, my friend guides me through this song by our friend Peter, newly dead, with the words of our cherished Therese. It is the closeness that keeps my voice a thin thread basting the low, difficult run. My ear wants to sweeten the deliberate dissonance. I want to keep my throat floating with the higher measures. I want to say it is Therese in my mouth, her devotion driving hours through Peter's notes, the spring light low through the window. But it is your touch to the keys, your playing, your face turning to mine that makes the singing a song. And then just this one last poem, which is a little lighter. <laughs> and this is happy, was included in uh, one of the anthologies uh, that Harry mentioned, the introduction, Romance Options from Daedalus Press. Out of the gutter into the frame. I am a child of my age. It's a split age where opposites attract like iron schmutz to the magnet calm that lets me quaff the bald man in the cardboard toy. I forget what I want to remember, but am plagued by memories like I'm a field and there are a cloud of locusts eating winter's store. Dust rains in my eyes, gravity flies in my face. What I let drop bounces back into my grip. All the tired analogies crowd me, butterflies setting free, nevers meant to be. What I attract is everything I have abandoned until I stand, helpless pin, bowled down by the lucky strike of love. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Jamie. I love the particulars that you have in your poetry and the love and death that you've talked about today, the you know, they're very clear-eyed and you have such a great narrative and they're also empathetic and compassionate. Uh, did I understand you right to sit, to hear you say that you and your husband are, uh, you have a Ukrainian woman and her child staying with you? We did. We did uh, for about eight and a half months. And um, then as I said, we had a, uh, kind of a major disaster in our house where the ceiling fell in and we had to move into the room they were staying in. So unfortunately the demolition wasn't able to start until we were, and it, what was great is that a neighbor, a man just around the corner took them in. So it was, the, the school year was still on. And so the little girl was able to continue at the same school. And so it's great. We're still just neighbors now. We get to see them. Well, that's great. You know, here at MPTF, uh, I forget what year it was, whether it was last year or the year before, MPTF adapt, uh, adopted a, a young Ukrainian woman and her young child. And mm -hmm. then later, you know, they had been on the East Coast. And then later, her husband, who had been in Ukraine, came here. So, you know, I'm always very touched when, you know, an institution, MPTF or you, you know, have been very generous to someone, uh, some people some ones who are in need. So thank you very much for that. Uh, one thing that I I loved last June, it was last June, 2022. One thing I love about your poetry is how you're able to take the particulars, you know, it could be about, you know, preparing dinner, you know, um, uh, I forget what it was about the, um, the vegetables you were making. And then you also include the big picture of war, Ukraine. And how do you do that? Do you, do you just do it naturally or do you have to work at that? Or, you know, I, you know, poetry is a, a form of particulars and also war obviously is a big theme. Could you just tell me how you how you do a poem that includes those? Well, I, I think, yeah, you know, thanks for asking and for everything. Your kind words, Harry. For that, I can vividly remember about that poem. This was that, that first poem. 
you know, making a white bean, white bean and cabbage soup is, you know, the, the war had just begun. Russia had just invaded and, and feeling helpless. Like, what am I doing? I'm out in the garden doing, you know, the late winter tasks and getting soup going and just feeling like this is all I can do. I mean, I can just tend my garden right now. And, but thinking about what's going on in another part of the world. And, and it's like, it's kind of like think globally, but write locally. <laughs> you know, I mean, what, <laughs> we have to, you know, I mean, people always say, you know, so many of us have heard, you know, write what you know. And I can't write as if I'm on the front line. But I would say that in a way, you know, the hosting was a front line of its own, you know, seeing, you know, being able to be with, with someone who, you know, the, the trauma she'd experienced, you know, you just, uh, shortly after she moved in, we were having a, a thunderstorm and we don't get them in the West of Ireland. We get a lot of wind and a lot of rain, but we don't have lightning and thunder very often, but it was thundering. And I said, oh, you know, we don't have this very often. And she said, better than bombs, better than the missiles right away. Yeah. Oh, well, you are, you are to be commended for your calmness and for a way to write about the war that's meaningful and includes a calm spirit. Mm -hmm. I start thinking about that mess and I just get enraged and out of control. Do you rewrite much or do you, uh, Jamie, do you re rewrite much or how do you do it? one of your poems? You know, I would say that particular poem, I didn't do a lot with that, but some of the others I did move a lot. I mean, I play around with white space a lot <laughs> to see how it is on the page. I mean, there are a couple of these poems that are single stanzas, some are in couplets, some in terms, you know, I just, and some don't really have a, any kind of even arrangement of the lines, but I do. And I have a, a poetry group that we, which we started meeting with during the lockdown time, meeting on Zoom and, um, and it helped a lot, helped a lot. You know, I, I love having someone read and tell me what they hear and what they see in a poem because there are things I just, I'm, I, I don't know, I'm too close to it. So I really appreciate having other readers and getting their input. So I do revise a lot. Well, you know, Clive and Jamie, what, what would you like to say? We have a few minutes left. What would you like to say to each other about each other's poetry? I know Clive... <laughs> said a little bit, why don't you start with Jamie uh, and why don't you say a word or two about Clive's poetry and then Clive can do the, the same to you. Oh, God, yeah, I was really loved hearing you, Clive. And um, I appreciated you talking about your journey. And I, I'm also going to look up that art, that interview in Interlit Q because this idea of the foundation and the beads, but then you've moved beyond, but it's still, the, our foundations stick with us, I think. You know, some of the early teachers I had and people I read, I read a lot of Adrian Rich. I, uh, William Matthews was an important teacher for me. And I, you know, I have that influence. I really appreciate that. And um, the sonnets, the peacock poem, and hearing you, the travelogue. <laughs> And the importance of meditation in your work. I, I really enjoyed hearing all of that. I found it fascinating. Uh, <clears throat> thank you so much, Jamie. It is, I mean, I've, I've needed so much help along the way. And I've just finally come to a place where I understand a little bit about the journey. Mm. It's, and I, I, I love that I found the phrase instinct to be my guide. And I could see that that was happening all along, but I wasn't conscious of it. I'm just a, like an, uh, an animal. I was going to say a rat just trying to find his way through the tunnels. But it's, uh, it's, it's sort of like that. It's, it's at such a um, unconscious level, unconscious and powerful level what we do. And I, I think there's something going on like that with yours. And, and what was so obvious early on as you were reading is that you're, you're involved in the war, your conscience is really involved in the war. And yet you can filter it into your life in ways that tame it a little. Mm. It's not like you're not dealing with the pain. It's just like you're not letting it you know, throw throw the whole 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 enterprise askew. 
you find really human things to say about your subjects. And I'm just, uh, that's so moving. Uh, Maybe I'm a guy, I want to get my toy pistol out and just destroy everything and start over, you know. I don't know, but I really admired your poems, Jamie. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much, both of you. Uh, Jamie O'Halloran and Clyde Metz, and this has really been a revelatory, uplifting, and we've dealt with some serious subjects, too. Yeah. Thank you both for letting us know about your journey and what you're doing in the present and for your empathy of the people in Ukraine. And so uh, I will take one minute before the show ends and just say that Next Tuesday, the marvelous actors Corinne Conley, Helen Richmond, Kay Wiseman, and Shannon Wilcox, a new uh, actor here at uh, MPTF, will read from The Carrying by Ada Limon, who's the first mm -hmm. Latina poet laureate of the United mm -hmm. States. So that's our show. And here's our wonderful director, uh, Jennifer Clymer. Thank you again for an amazing hour. I, <laughs> I'm always struck. And... Um, Harry, the couple, uh, the couple and the the family that moved onto the campus that was a year ago in June. Um, they moved on just before our hundredth uh, anniversary special, so that's how I always mark it. That we celebrated a couple of years late because of COVID, uh, or a year and a half late because of COVID, and they moved on um, just before that event. So. And we're, we're honored to have them. They are a part of our community now. And I agree, Clive. Sometimes I do want to just take different parts of the map and say, we're starting again. <laughs> <laughs> we, this clean slate, we start, we build from scratch. But um, no, the right thing to do is to make soup and open your home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It might be humanity's, humanity's job now is to recreate the soul of our species because mm. we sure messed it up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. It's a, lot to, it's a lot to think about. I'm excited to welcome you guys back again. Thank you for being on Harry's Poetry Hour. We love having you guys. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting us. Thank, thank you. you.